Hey you guys, it's Tom from Tom's Interesting Talk and today we're breaking down Dune Messiah. I am super stoked to talk about this book in particular and potential part three of the Dune movies. This movie takes place 12 years in the future after we've taken out Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV, after we've taken out the Harkonnens, and after we've secured Arrakis, the planet Dune, for, for the Atreides and for the Fremen people. When Paul takes out the Sardaukar, which is the Padishah Emperor's forces, the Emperor is forced into negotiations with Paul. And you got to remember, by this time, Paul has seen this vision, and Paul has seen the future from taking the Water of Life. The Water of Life helps open his prescient visions, and he's able to see a number of future timelines. I mean, pretty quickly he realizes, you know, that through all these different timelines and through being able to see the future, the only way he's going to be able to survive himself, his family, his name, Fremen people, he has to go down this particular path, which includes marrying the Princess Irulan, which is Padishah Emperor's daughter. Through this path, a lot of things happen, of course. And then this is where we kick in. 12 years in the future. I'm interested to see how they do this part three. You know, are they going to focus on the jihad that happens? Or are they going to focus on exactly how the book lines the story out? Because the book starts out on Wolric 9. And you got Bene Gesserit, Reverend Mother Mah Mahayan. You have a guy named Edric. You have the Princess Irulan, a face dancer named Sidetail that are all plotting against Paul Atreides. Like they could do Messiah in a couple different parts, just like they did the book Dune. Because Paul and his Fremen Jihad have to go after the great houses and wipe them the hell out because they do not accept Paul and his emperorship because he had taken out uh, Padishah Emperor Saddam IV. They just don't accept that, and they don't accept him as the emperor. So he goes the hell after him, and he starts what's called the Holy War, his Jihad War, and systematically wipes all the great houses out. You guys, we're talking about 61 billion, hold on, billion people. Fremen and his Jihad systematically take out 61 billion people. This is crazy. You figure out Hitler took out about 6 million people. Genghis Khan, what, 4 million people? Those are just a couple of, you know, nasty bastards from our history here on Earth. So, you know, the, the scope of Paul Atreides and the Fremen's jihad is massive. I mean, absolutely massive. And I'll be interested in Dune Part 3 if they actually talk about and show this jihad. In the book, it really doesn't talk about it too much. It talks about the number, it talks about, you know, all the destruction, but it doesn't really go through it. It doesn't describe it. So this would be a different path that the director could take by actually showing the Fremen actually go through with the Jihad and systematically taking out each world if they wanted to show it that way. But the book itself starts off on a planet called Woolrich 9. And you have a face dancer called Sidetail, you have the Reverend Mother Mohayam, a space guildsman named Edric, and then Princess Irulan, all plotting against Paul, you know, and how they're going to take down the Emperor and stop the Jihad. So after he takes the Water of Life and he becomes Paul the Messiah, or Paul Muad'Dib, he can basically see humanity's destruction. He can see all these different paths that lead down these even worst roads of destruction. You know, you got to figure by this point, he's wiped out 61 billion people. But to him, he's already seen all these different expansive paths or futures where it's worse. Human species, as we know it, basically is wiped out. And God, in some ways, humans are staled and stalled because of politics and because of all the different, you know, religious rites and all the different things that are going on in the universe. And he sees one path out of these multitude of paths that... Uh, that his vision gives him, he sees one path that the human species and himself and his sister Aaliyah and his mother and all the people around him can prosper. The planet Dune, the Fremen, Arrakis can prosper. 
he sees one path. So to him, this jihad that the Fremen go on, the 61 billion people that they kill in his name, basically is not the worst path. I don't know about you, but 61 billion people, I don't care which path it is, that's a hell of a lot of people to kill and wipe out, even for the success of the human race. I mean, we've seen this in Marvel, you know, with Thanos and, you know, and his snap, basically, with the gauntlet and all the Infinity Stones. And he basically has to make this same decision, Thanos' decision, a Messiah decision, you know, to go on this jihad, bring the great houses and the universe uh, to one collective, you know, one collective religion and one collective belief, which he feels is the only path for success, not only for his family, but for humans and all the great houses and the universe to be successful. So it's a, the gravity of, of this decision that he's made um, is pretty substantial. And to him, he battles internally with this decision of killing 61 billion people. So I don't think Frank quite wanted everybody or his fans to see Paul as this great messiah. So he writes, so he writes the book, Dune Messiah, and he kind of explains this decision that Paul's made and this path that Paul's went down. Well, it's quite interesting. So as the book starts out, and we'll just start talking about the book because I just recently got finished with Dune Messiah. I mean, I've read the book before and I've read Children of the Dune and I've read quite a few of the Dune books because I'm just a huge fan of this series in general. But this one here has a little different feel to it because it's basically a counteraction to, um, to Paul's up and coming story, to Paul's story of attrition you know, in the first Dune. So, we, like I said, we start out on Warwick 9, we have these people, people close to him, that he knows are plotting against him, are plotting uh, to try to kill him, to try to assassinate him. As we all know, uh, Duncan Idaho, you know, his, his teacher, basically dies by the sword trying to protect Paul and his mother Jessica. So the Talaxu have technology to bring back the dead to basically take flesh and reanimate flesh. And they create what's called a gola out of the late Duncan Idaho's body. When a gola is formed, it'd be like a clone. You know, a clone of me would not have all the life experience and all the wisdom of my life. You know, it would have to be taught. I mean, it would be the same person, same DNA, same everything, with different views, of course, and a different path through life, which would, which would change the person's perception. They come up with this plan to give Duncan Idaho back to Paul. So the Tlaxu train Duncan Idaho to assassinate Paul. You gotta read the book because I can't sit here and explain, you know, every detail to this to this story to the point where you're gonna understand everything that I'm saying to you. So it's a big plot. You know, Duncan Idaho is supposed to go back and basically gain trust of Paul Atreides and at the right time, there Duncan has been trained to assassinate Paul. And Duncan kind of knows this, truthful about this when he's presented to Paul as far as, you know, him being potentially Paul's destruction. But Paul is so driven and he basically has protected and died for Paul at this point. So what better person, and honestly it was a great plan on their part, to take down Paul in this manner. So you have to remember, there's a lot of different characters in this. And they talk about this in this meeting on Walric 9. Aaliyah, which is Paul's sister, which was... You know, the baby that basically the Reverend Mother Jessica had in her womb when she took the water of life and became the Reverend Mother of the Fremen. Well, of course, when she takes the, the water of life, you know, she sees all the future paths of, or she all of a sudden has the knowledge of all the future paths of all the Reverend Mothers before her. And her daughter, Aaliyah, which is the baby that's in her womb currently, it's all these future paths as well, and basically is born a Reverend Mother and with all the knowledge of a Reverend Mother at a very young age. So Aaliyah is, you know, 12, 13 years old, 14 years old, um, and she's kind of coming of age. So they know that they should be able to use this gala to not only get in with Paul, but potentially, you know, he's a good looking guy. You know, we've all met Jason Momoa, <laughs> Duncan Idaho. Jason Momoa is a hot dude. So they think they can um, use Duncan Idaho to potentially attract Aaliyah. So at this point in the story, you know, Paul is kind of, you know, he's been ruling for 12 years, you know, he's, his jihad has killed 61 billion people, and he's in control of all these great houses, you know, hundreds and thousands of different planets across the known universe, and he's helped transform, you know, Arrakis, 
Um, I believe the southern parts of Arrakis are now uh, a water oasis. You know, all the all the wells or the catches of water that the Fremen had been saving um, and working on, they've released all this water, um, and they've slowly but surely tried to change, you know, the landscape of Arrakis and kind of terraform it, so to speak. But the rudimentariness of being an emperor you know, of this religion or this, of the Fremen and an emperor of all these great houses, emperor of the known universe has kind of weighed heavy on him. Like he kind of misses his old life. He misses, he misses basically the path that led him to this point and the dogma, you know, it's, he's kind of gotten to a point where, where he knows his time is coming to an end as the leader. That was all part of his plan to keep his whole family in power and him be, and him become the emperor. But now he realizes that you know, the next part in his plan, which is an heir. You know, he has to have an heir to the throne. So Irulan, this whole time, basically has been giving a contraceptive uh, to Cheney, Paul's concubine or his, his lover. You know, however you want to say it, you know, the book always references Cheney as his concubine Cheney. You know, but Cheney is Paul's wife, Paul's lover, you know, his partner in life. And he has seen a path where if Cheney gives birth, to Paul's heir, she is going to die in childbirth. And he's seen this. So he's dragged his feet and dragged his feet and kind of known of Irulan, you know, basically administering this contraceptive to Cheney this whole time. Um, and she hasn't been able to get pregnant. So this plot works along those same lines to try to get Paul to basically impregnate Irulan, the princess Irulan, to pass on the throne and to produce an heir. But Paul doesn't want to do this. You know, Paul's in love with Cheney, and Paul's commitment is Cheney. So he promises her that, you know, he will not at Irland, even for, to carry on his name, you know, and create an heir for the throne. So Cheney basically tells Paul that, hey, I'm okay with you sleeping with Irland. I'm okay with you, you know, getting her pregnant if that's what's going to help carry on her name and help carry on and give the throne an heir. And, and Paul's very, Paul is very much so not willing to do this. And the whole time he doesn't explain to her, like he doesn't want to tell her that, you know, it, the minute you get pregnant, basically your life's over. You know, we have those nine months that you're pregnant and then you're going to die in childbirth. And he even knows because of the addiction of the melange, the spice, he realizes that from his vision, the baby is going to grow much, much faster than a regular birth because of the melange and the addictiveness to the spice. You know, the spice has a lot of things. It extends life. It, 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 it just does so many different things. It also makes childbirth you know, progress and go faster, so to speak. So Paul knows all this. It's part of his plan. You know, he's seen it the whole time. So he's been reluctant to want to get Cheney pregnant. And he's been totally okay with Yerlan giving her the contraceptive. Well, Cheney, you know, having this conversation with Paul, basically says the hell with this, you know, and she goes on this, what's called a Fremen fertility rite, or fertility diet. And that kind of stops um, Yerlan from being able to give her this contraceptive. Well, this contraceptive, it's been given to her now for almost 12 years, and it's kind of messed her up a little bit. It's made it made her. It's made it harder for her to conceive. Um, so she goes on this diet, and Paul actually does not see this part. She doesn't realize that she's on this diet, and they end up. You know, he ends up getting her pregnant. So Cheney and the doctors, you know, realize because of the contraceptive, and it's almost like a poison that's been given to her. Realize that she's going to need to go on this really extensive diet to be able to make it through this pregnancy, to even be able to, you know, carry this, this child to term. She goes on this diet of spice, real high doses of it to help her body cope with, you know, the changes of the pregnancy. Well, little does she know, and Paul doesn't know this, in his vision, he sees the child being one daughter. Well, Cheney ends up getting pregnant with twins, one daughter and one son, which is really, really cool. So. That ends up being basically what kills Cheney. Yes, Cheney dies in childbirth still, but you know, has the twins, Paul's actual maternal twins, in the process of this, of this death and this pregnancy. So through this plot, from the beginning of the book, a Tlaxu face dancer named Sightail, you know, and then the Spacing Guild navigator, Edric, Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother Mohayam, you know, they're all come, and Irulan, are, have all come up with this plot. The Tlaxu face dancers are genetically altered humans that can basically change their form to whoever they see. He has all this special training. Um, and that's a whole nother part of it. 
you know, because you have to remember there are no computers. There are no use of AI in the Dune universe. It's all done by human beings, basically. Human beings teach and train themselves, basically, to be, to be biological computers. This is how they do all the calculations. You know, as being an emperor, of course you have all these different duties. You know, you have duties to the Spacing Guild, you have duties to all the different, you know, great houses that you've conquered. You know, it's all these different things that, that you have to do, like any government would have to do. His government has no attachment to what's called the Spacing Guild. And that's how this Rick basically is able to kind, to kind of get by Paul's side. So they, every planet or every great house has its own Spacing Guild consulate, so to speak. And Arrakis at this point doesn't have one. The base powers that be kind of get Paul to agree on being able to have a Spacing Guild consulate on Arrakis. And this Edric is who they send um, as a representation for, this, for the consulate. Well, as part of Edric joining Arrakis and starting this newly formed consulate, they offer up Duncan Idaho, the Gala, better known as Hate, which is a weird name for a person, but you know that was the name that, that the Talaxu that, that created him gave him. Hate, H-Y-T-E, which is an, an odd and interesting way to spell Hate. So they offer up Duncan Idaho as uh, a present. So this is how Duncan Idaho is presented the, the, the Emperor Paul Atreides or Paul Muabdib, however you want to call him at this point. Um, and that's how Duncan Idaho gets by his side, and that's how Duncan Idaho infiltrates Paul's inner circle, so to speak. And the Spacing Guildsman, Edric, is able to infiltrate, you know, his inner circle. You know, he already has, or this group already has Irulan, which is part of the initial plan, too. You know, and that's kind of how this all came about. Because, see, Irulan is still in contact with the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood. Um, you know, she's a true princess. Like, she was raised a princess and has all these connections to, you know, a lot of these different planets and all, and these kind of things. So this is part of their plan to basically get Duncan close to Paul. And Paul plays into this. Duncan Idaho is this figure to him. And even though he knows that Duncan Idaho and Duncan tells him, like I said, that basically I am your destruction. And he does not lie. And Paul asks him, you know, why should I trust you? And he says he shouldn't. You should not trust me. But Paul has this feeling. And well, so Spacing Guildsman has Prescient's sight as well. And through his sight, he can kind of block or put like a bubble around, block out certain parts of, vi of Paul's visions, basically. And that's why they really need Edric, the Spacing Guildsman, to be part of this plan. Because when they're talking on Wolric 9, they need his ability to be able to block out all that conversation and Paul's potential takeover from Paul. So... So Paul has seen some of this, but he has not seen all of it. But man, he is very, very good at deducing. You know, he, he's what's called Hintat training, and he has all these different trainings, you know, Bene Gesserit training, uh, just control of your features and emotion, and you know, all these different things. Mentat training is basically like computer training. It's, it's so you can use your mind as a computer rather than needing a computer. It's interesting how they've come up with these technologies, these biological technologies, because they don't trust AI, they didn't trust computers and they didn't trust that path. So Paul accepts Edric as, as the representation of the Spacing Guild on Arrakis. Duncan Idaho is given as a present to Paul. Paul accepts Duncan even though Duncan tells him basically I'm your destruction. Aaliyah, Paul's sister, it's kind of crazy because the whole time that this meeting is going on between Edric and the Gala, uh, Duncan Idaho, Aaliyah, the sister, she's basically watching all this from afar and she doesn't understand by Paul accepts Duncan or the Gala other than just send him away or kill him or you know she doesn't understand any of it and and, and that part of the book is a, is a whole story in itself hearing her kind of in her own mental her own mental mind going back and forth with all these different possible scenarios and what could happen basically the plan to take down Paul and the plot to take down Paul came up with the Gala is supposed to attract Aaliyah and potentially distract Aaliyah um, from being able to help them kill Paul and help Duncan Idaho or the Gala hate to be able to get closer to Paul so that when um, so when hate's given the command that hate, will be, that hate will be close enough to go ahead to kill Paul and take him out as emperor. This story is fascinating you guys and it is very complicated. I can tell you it's a hell of a read and you've got to be able you got to be a pretty decent reader um, because of the 
the terminology and the things and the different names for all this stuff that they come up with, <laughs> it, it gets a word a little wordy in, in the way Frank wrote it. But man, that's just the way Frank Herbert writes. And it's very cool how he uses the English language. I love it personally. Um, it's very sci-fi and it's, it's very right for this story, in my opinion. And once you read it and you understand how the story is put together, you see how it all fits. And, it, and it's really neat. So basically, Paul accepts Duncan Idaho. Aaliyah accepts Duncan. But there's these, like Paul's battling the whole time, you know, in his inner voice, you know, why Duncan was given to him. You know, what is his purpose? What, you know, how is he supposed to kill Paul and be Paul's destruction? And there's this whole back and forth with Duncan Idaho or hate and Paul as they go through all this you know and he kind of goes back and forth with Duncan as well as dealing with all the issues of being an emperor and leading and being a husband and being a brother and being all the different things that make life complicated as you mature and go through life so the whole time this is happening this Talaxu face dancer Sightail he has to figure out a way to get close to Paul as well and you remember, so he's a face dancer. He's able to take on the form of the people that he sees. So he has to basically find a way to infiltrate Paul's inner circle. And he does that through some of Paul's old Fremen warriors. And Sidetail takes the form of the daughter of this Fremen warrior. And through Fremen culture, you know, the daughter goes to Paul and basically tells him that his father, that her father needs to speak with Paul about this Fremen plot to basically rebel and take down Paul. And through Fremen culture, you know, Paul has to accept this invitation um, because of the way the Fremen people live and the way they, they coalesce with each other. You know, these great houses with these houses within the Fremen culture, you know, these, they're, they're, very, they're a very tight-knit group of people. So when, when Sidetail is impersonating this daughter and Sidetail basically in this daughter's form goes to Paul and says, hey, I need you, my dad needs you, my dad needs to speak with you. Paul's felt, Paul, Paul himself feels obligated to do this. And Paul feels like he has to, you know, do this by himself. And, and Paul's a very proud man, you know, he's a very proud guy. He has these visions, and you know, his prescient visions, and he can see all this, you know, all these future plans. And he feels pretty confident in his, in his ability to be able to, you know, go amongst his people and go see this old man uh, and have this conversation that he's been asked to go have. So he sets up, you know, this this whole thing. Well, during this time that he needs to go see this old man, there's this big convention of sorts where all the Fremen people, and at this point, you know, it's been 12 years, and this religion has been spread across, you know, the known universe. So all these people come from all over the universe to worship Paul and, and his religion and his messiah. And his messianess. <laughs> I know that's probably not a word, but so while while all this is happening, you know, he has Aaliyah represent himself, represent Paul on this big stage for all these people that are gathering to worship him and to worship in him. So the plot gets a little bit thicker. You know, Paul sets out to go meet this this father of the daughter that came to him and find out, you know, what this Fremen conspiracy is and try to basically cut the head off the snake of this Fremen conspiracy, or what he's been told. So he sets in motion this plan for Leah to represent him on the big stage in front of all these people. And Paul sneaks basically through this crowd to the house of this of this father that he's supposed to meet. Well, during this time, you know, of course, he's in his still suit and, you know, he's all decked out so that his people can't recognize him because supposedly he's on stage. All of his Fremen warriors that are protecting him are doing like any like there's it's like a cloak and dagger kind of thing so they're set up on the fringes of his path you know they have thopters up in the air kind of at a, a great distance you know so not to um, um, arouse suspicion um that he could be down there you know he has his fremen kind of placed and fremen warriors kind of placed in little places here and there to be able to watch him but at a really far distance you know so that not to raise suspicion because paul knows that this is part of the plot to take him down deep down inside he knows this um, but he has to play along. He knows the story. He knows the path. He can see it. He's seen it. And he knows what's supposed to happen. Uh, so he comes across, so he finally makes it to this guide. This guide is supposed to take him to the house where this father is. And they get to the house, and the father ends up having this, this dwarf named Bajaz, which is also Talaxu, 
uh, that's infiltrated this other family and was also there when Duncan Idaho was created in the Tlaxu tanks when his flesh was brought back. He was part of this plot. They had planted in Duncan Idaho or the Gala Hates mind like a command, like a humming intonation or basically when I get to three, you'll do this. One, two, three, snap your fingers, you know, you come out of the trance. But in this case, it would basically change Duncan Idaho from the nice guy he is now to this killer and basically wipe out Paul and kill Paul. So Paul's seeing this basically through his vision as he's, as he's going to meet this old man and talk to him. And they go through the whole process. And this was the plan the whole time. They had set up what's called a stone burner weapon and supposedly these stone burner weapons blinds basically everybody within, you know, a certain radius. It's like an atomic or a radiation of some sort that blinds the people that are around the explosion. So Paul gets out of this house. The old man basically gives Bajaz, the dwarf, to Paul. Bajaz is supposed to know the names of the Fremen conspirators. And the Fremen conspirators are supposed to be in another house up the road or something like that. And the old man basically tells Bajaz to show Paul where these Fremen conspirators are. So Paul begins following Bajaz out of the house and up the street to these so-called Fremen conspirators. Well, in the meantime, there's a stone burner bomb in the house that Paul just came out of. And, and this stone burner bomb goes off and it blinds Paul and it blinds basically all the people around him. And it's this dwarf Bajaz because he has Tlaxu eyes. And there is some mechanical eyes and, you know, you know, they're not the stone burner radiation or whatever it is that causes blindness doesn't affect him that way. So Paul has become blinded by the stone burner bomb. But what's cool is Paul, you know, per Fremen religion or Fremen customs or whatnot, if you're blind, you're basically no use to the Fremen anymore. So you go on the holy journey of... The blind are exiled to the desert, and Shailud, the worms, basically eat, eat these blind people in the desert, and it's supposedly a, a, a great way to die, you know, a great way to go out. Um, desert takes, takes the blind. So they all realize that Paul has been blinded at this point, but Paul has his present vision, and he can basically see what's going on. He's already seen it. So he somehow taps into his vision, and he's able to to go on with the plan and go on with what he needs to do to continue as as Emperor Paul Muad'Dib. So the Fremen accept his prescient sight as, you know, him not being blind. So they continue to follow, follow him. As all this is going on, you know, Cheney, of course, has gotten pregnant and she is, went south or went to the siege to be a birth, to be in a safe place, be in her, her siege to give birth to her children, her potential children, her potential heir to the throne, Paul's, Paul's child. Of course I say child because Paul still only thinks it's one child. Um, and for some reason he does not see that it's uh, twins, a boy and a girl. So all this stuff happens, you know, Paul gets away, but Jazz gets away, you know, they save all the people, you know, and they clean up and everything, you know, everything kind of goes back to normal and Cheney gives birth and Cheney dies. So Bajaz, they kind of have Bajaz like locked up at this point because they think he's part of the plot. So Duncan is interviewing this dwarf Bajaz in his cell, and Bajaz sings him the the notation, the annotation, and unlocks Duncan's hate. We well, gotta remember these sieges are very small. You know, they're cave-like structures. They're not the biggest places in the world. So this is happening in a cell, you know, and then and just a little ways down the hallway. And the siege basically is is chaining, uh, giving you know giving birth and dying giving birth to Paul's kids. It's, you guys, this story is really, it's just really, really neat. And uh, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna even do it justice. I just don't know if I'm gonna do it justice. You guys just need to read the book or wait for the movie to come out because it is absolutely fucking amazing. And there's so many small details in this story that it's just gonna captivate you. And Frank Herbert did a great job when he wrote this. You know, he's amazing at, you know, the arc, the over arc, the antagonist, the protagonist, the, just creating these story, these, these story layers that just entice the senses. You know, there's so many little things going on that at any one time as you're reading, you know, you could, you could really like focus on this, this one little thing outside the scope of the main storyline. God, and that could be a story in itself. All these little things are happening. 
So to get back to the ending of this book, Paul is grief stricken. Janie is his love, his life, you know. I mean, he's been avoiding getting her pregnant for years now because he knew it'd be her death. And he knew his life and his reign is ready to come to an end. And he's sad about it, you know. He's sad that Cheney died. But he's also very interested by the twins because he did not see the twins coming. He only saw one girl being born. Um, and that's what ends up shocking him. So in the birthing chamber, basically Duncan, Paul, um, Cheney's body, two infants, you know, the birthing mothers or the people that helped, helped um, Cheney give birth to the twins are in this chamber, side tail, um, as this daughter of the father, you know, still in disguise, are all in this chamber. And Paul's just kind of going through it in his mind. He's grief stricken and all these things are happening and he's all this pain and emotions happening within him. And somehow his newborn son, somehow they're able to connect. And there's conversation between Paul and his son. At this point, his prescient vision has basically come to an end. This is the path. And this is as far as he saw it to this point. And after all these things happen, Duncan ends up fighting this implant of this, you know, annotation. Um, after Bajaz basically snaps his fingers, so to speak, you know, and, and opens up this, this hate in Duncan that's supposed to kill Paul. Well, he fights through that. And through fighting through that, he basically finds his conscience again. He finds... Duncan Idaho, the original soul, the original person, Duncan Idaho, inside himself. He finds his consciousness of Duncan, and he realizes that Bajaz is the one that basically set this in motion. So they're in the they're in the chamber, and of course, you know, Paul's having a conversation with his newborn son, technically. Duncan tells him tells him that he is the real Duncan now. He basically tells him that he's found his consciousness and he found the key to unlock or the lever to unlock his consciousness. But yeah, remember, Paul's grief stricken. You know, there's still the plot to kill Paul. It's either going to be Duncan Idaho that killed him. It was going to be the Talaxu Dwarf Bajaz that could potentially kill him. Or the Talaxu Face Dancer, Sightail, which is still in the form of this daughter of the father that Paul, of one of Paul's um, warriors. And this daughter is in this chamber with them, with Cheney's body, the two kids, you know, this is it's just a whole bunch of people in this cha chamber. Paul, well, in grief, leans up against the wall, and he's kind of going through all this stuff, and he's talking with his son, and, and somehow he ends up connecting through the eyes of his son, and he's able to see the room through the eyes of his newborn son. This is an amazing ability. So this is how he sees Sightail try to assassinate him. Sightail basically takes his true form, and in, now he's trying to bargain with Paul for his life of his children. Sightail ends up pulling out a knife, threatening his, his children. And there's all these things going on. Just as Duncan Idaho was created in the Talaxu tanks, you know, his flesh was revived. Well, this plot is to bring back Cheney, bring Cheney to, back to life in this same manner and make her a gala. And this is the bargaining chip that Sidetail is using to try to basically save his own skin, to get the hell out of there and still take out Paul, you know, and make the whole plan, the whole plot work out. Well, through the negotiations and this and that, Paul basically tells Sidetail, let me think about it and da 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 and he tells him no. In the end, he tells him no, he does not want Cheney turned into a gala. He does not want Cheney's body or her flesh brought back to life like that. And Sightail really has, at that point, no bargaining chip because that was their one main bargaining chip. They thought through his grief and his love for Cheney that he would make that decision and that would give Sightail or the Gala Duncan an opportunity to be able to kill him um, through all this. It is quite the twist and turns. It's quite, it's a great story, you guys. And I know I'm not really doing it justice, but uh, I really connected with the story and found it to be just such an adventure you know, in a, in a what-if kind of story. And, yeah. But anyway, to get back to the final plot, after Sightail loses his bargaining chip, and Paul, he thinks Paul's blind and can't see him, chooses to assassinate Paul himself. And through the eyes of his newborn son, he sees Sightail basically unsheath his knife, begin to throw his knife at Paul, and potentially assassinate Paul. 
well, Paul sees it and is able to avoid it. And they kill, they kill Sightail. And Paul's saved. The twins are saved. And basically, they kind of live happily ever after. But that's not, of course, how it ends. Remember, at this point, Paul's prescient vision has kind of basically played has played its course. And he, this is this is as far as he had seen up to this point. And now he is kind of truly blind. So to get the Fremen to accept his two kids as basically potential emperor or potential leader of the Fremen, Paul has to, in Fremen custom, go out into the d desert and basically be eaten by Shia Lud. And that's what he does. And through that sacrifice, Stilgard and the Fremen commit themselves to Everything Paul's to the children. Of and that's where you get Children of the Dune. The next book in the Dune series, the the Children of the Dune, is based on twins, Analia and Duncan Idaho, as the Gala. Um, and that leads into this next book, which is a fucking fascinating story too, you guys. It just doesn't end. There's six books in this series. And then his son wrote more books after that and kind of filled in the spaces as well. So this story goes on and on in this Dune universe. Um, and it's... It's only getting better and better, in my opinion. You guys, I'm just, I, I just wanted to talk about this book. It was a great story, and my layman's way of explaining this story, and my layman's way of explaining how Frank Herbert, and why Frank Herbert wrote this second book, you know, is, is just out of a fandom, you know, my passion for, for this series, you know, and this story. So I hope I brought a little bit of light to this next, you know, iteration of the Dune series. And I hope I brought a little light to Dune Messiah, the book. It is a great read. And in some ways, probably not a fan favorite. Children of the Dune, I think, fan-wise, is a, is a more fan favorite book than the Messiah. But I think Messiah, as a continuation from book one, Dune, is the, basically the perfect way to end this story. Or end this part of, the, of Paul Atreides' story as a Messiah. You guys, thanks for sitting and listen, listening to me for a little bit. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you listening to me stumble through this. Hopefully, you saw the passion you went for me from this story. And hopefully, I will maybe get you excited about this next part or this next movie in the Dune universe. You guys, thank you. Thanks for spending some time with me. If you like this, please like and subscribe. You know that's what makes it all go around. It's not doesn't cost you anything. And we would love to keep bringing you this kind of content. I would love to keep telling you about books from the Dune series and any other, anything else that I'm passionate about and hopefully I will help you be passionate about as well. Thanks again. Please click on the video above. Yep, right there.